If I've not had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Wendell, and I am, uh, as Kristen said, the uh, Minister of Care here at Eastern Hills Bible Church. And we're in the second week of our uh, series that we've titled Our Imperfect Families. That's so we can all feel comfortable being here together, right? So before I begin, uh, Steve read the thesis for our series, and we're going to do that together. So you'll see it up here on the screen once you join with me. When it comes to family, we don't have a choice in the matter, but the choices we make as a family matter. I don't think too many of us would disagree with that statement. Now, for some of us here, we, we hear the word family, and we, we have feelings of love and comfort and support. It brings a, a smile to our face, and I'm grateful that's true for me. I'm just very, very grateful for my, my mom and dad and my brothers, but also for my own family. But I know that's also not true for everybody. In fact, for many people, it's extreme opposite, and there's all kinds of reasons for why that's true. One family's choices and decisions have a positive impact, and then another family's choices bring about brokenness and pain. But the choices that were made mattered and made a difference even when those who were making those decisions had no idea what they were doing or how they would impact their family now and then into the future. Now, here's something that you, you hear a lot today. As long as the choices you make do not affect others, then you are free to do what you want to do. So I kind of I looked through uh, my Greek Bible to find a word that defines that, and it says hogwash. I think that was the word I found out with. <laughs> it's kind of Greeky. I, I might have made that part up. I'm not sure. That's a contradictory statement, isn't it? Because every choice, every decision that we make will either impact us or those around us, which includes our families. It can be the big decisions that we make, but it can also be those really teeny ones that we don't think much about. So as I was preparing for the message, I read something uh, about called the butterfly effect. Have you ever heard of it before? It's kind of crazy. In simple, in simple words, it's something that you do now, like maybe reading a book or even listening to this awesome sermon, can result in changing your entire future as well as the future of others. And it's the idea that the disturbance of the air by a little and insignificant butterfly has enough power to form different kinds of weather, weather patterns all over the world, like a typhoon. Uh, the guy who came up with this, uh, there'll be a quiz at the end, you need to know his name, Edward Norton Lorenz. He was an American mathematician and a meteorologist, and he discovered this. And he found the details of a hurricane, like the formation when it begins, is influenced by small factors like the flapping of a butterfly's wing, far, far away from the spot that the hurricane started. So what does that mean? The, a tiny choice that you and I make today can be the foundation of a sequence of millions of events and consequent choices that will shape your future and the future of other people. And you go, Wendell, what does that have to do with us today? Great question. What I want to do today is I want to take some time to look at an individual in a not-so-perfect family who was majorly impacted by the choices and decisions that were made within his family, but also by others. And not only do those choices and decisions impact that person, it impacted an entire nation, and it was the nation of Israel. And so the, the guy that we're talking about is Joseph. Many of you know of Joseph and the multicolored robe that he had. Uh, we find his story in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, and it's in chapters 37 to chapter 50. And uh, I'm going to be reading just spatters of little parts of the scripture. And I encourage you, if you've not read the whole story, go home. It won't take you that long and read the story. So what, I, what I'm going to do, is I want to take a look at a number of the different choices that were made and the impact that they had on Joseph. Uh, then I'd like to talk about his response to all that he faced, because I think we can learn a lot from him on how we can deal with the consequences of choices that were made many, many years ago within our families. And so uh, I want to start by just showing a picture of Joseph's family tree. You can see it up there. Uh, Joseph was one son. He was one of 12. His dad's name was Jacob. He's also called Israel. God renames him in there. But remember, there was Abraham, and there was Isaac, and then there was Jacob. So let me read the first four verses of chapter 37. 
Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So let's take a look at the first choice that created some issues for Joseph. It was a choice that his father made. And when you look at it, it could have been as almost as teeny as a butterfly wing that was flapping. And it says here that he loved Joseph more than his other brothers. And he gave them this coat, this little coat. So what's the big deal? What's the big deal? In the simplest terms, Joseph's robe of, of, of colors symbolized favor. Everybody knew when they looked at Joseph that he was daddy's boy. And that daddy loved him more than the other ones. And the, it was an elaborate work of art that was made to stand out. So when Joseph walked in the room, everybody knew who he was. It spoke of nobility. His brothers probably wore shepherd's clothing as they were out in the field. But Joseph came around with this coat. And this set his brothers in a place where they did not appreciate him very much. And I don't know about you, but I don't know if I blame them. That's a really hard place to be. Nobody likes to be the odd man out or the unfavored one. And they were jealous. And their jealousy would reach a tipping point. So what was the impact then of a little robe by dad to Joseph? The brothers hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, I don't think it helped either that Joseph brought back some bad report. Hey, Dad, the boys are out in the field and they weren't doing what they're supposed to do. And uh, comes with his coat and it wasn't very, very good. Um, the next decision, the next decision was because of the brother's hate. Uh, Jacob sends Joseph out to check on the boys. Of course, what is he wearing when he goes to check on them? He's got his robe. I'm the special one. And when the brothers see him coming, they decide to do something. In verse 18 of chapter 37, but they saw him in the distance and before he reached and they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Now, I might have said growing up, boy, I hate my brother, but I never planned on killing him. Right? I hated maybe what he did to me or that he got the bigger piece of pie. Um, I, yeah, I, but I never wanted to kill him. And thankfully, they didn't do that. But they do make another choice. They sold Joseph to some merchants who were on their way to Egypt. Verse 23 of same chapter 37. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spice, balm, and myrrh, and they're on their way to take them down to Egypt. Just stop to think about what Joseph was feeling. Uh, He comes. He knows now that they want to do something really bad to him. He probably heard that they wanted to kill him. He's been stripped of his robe. He's been put in the hole, and all of a sudden, he's all by himself. A little decision with a robe has impacted a whole lot of things in his life. And then, what's the impact? Ultimately, they sell him to be a slave to Potiphar down in Egypt. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Potiphar's officials, the captain of the guard. And so now he's a favored one, and now he's a slave. Decisions impacted his life big time. Now, This next choice that Joseph's Joseph's brothers made didn't really impact him very much. But again, we see how their decision impacted their father. They chose to deceive and lie to Jacob about what happened. They took his robe. They ripped it up. They killed an animal. They put some blood on it. They brought it back to dad and said, Dad, check it out. Your son was killed by a ferocious animal. What was the impact on dad? He said he mourned. He mourned and mourned. He ripped his robe, a sign of, of grief, and he wept. For his son. Many decisions, many, many, much, much impact. 
So things don't get too much better for Joseph if you continue to read the story. About 15 plus or minus years, we have this series of ups and downs and ups and downs in his life with no hope of him ever being reunited with his, with his father and his other family. But during that time, God's hand was on Joseph, and Potiphar ends up entrusting his whole house to his care. And he goes from being a slave to really having a lot of privilege. And that's because of how hard he worked. But that doesn't last very long because Mrs. Potiphar had eyes for Joseph. And she would day in and day out, day in and day out, Joseph, come sleep with me. And Joseph said, no, I'm not going to do that because of his integrity. And once again, he's thrown into prison. One more time, one more bad impact on his life. Again, though, Joseph finds favor with the guards. Things are going well. He thinks he might have an opportunity to get out of jail. He interpreted a dream for a baker and the chief cupbearer. And uh, he says, hey, chief cupbearer person, remember me before Pharaoh. But what happens? He doesn't remember. And he stays in jail. We're going to jump all the way up to chapter 41, which is why you're going to go home and read chapters 37 to 50 so you can get the whole story, right? I want to encourage you to do that. We come to chapter 41. Pharaoh has a dream. Nobody can interpret it. Pharaoh's cupbearer goes, I remember Joseph. He interpreted my dream and everything he said came true. So jo Joseph is brought before Pharaoh and he interprets his dream. Genesis 41 verse 28, it is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be severe. And at that very moment, Joseph went from being a prisoner to being the prime minister in Egypt. He went from prisoner to prime minister. He was one step below Pharaoh in his position of authority and his importance in Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and people are to submit to your orders. And everything happens just as Joseph said. Seven years of abundance, everything they needed, they stored the grain, and then seven years later, famine hits the area, and the whole world comes to Egypt for grain, including his father, his whole family, actually. What a change in his circumstances. I want to stop just for a moment here. I don't think Joseph would have chosen any of the things that he had to deal with that he was going through. I don't think Joseph would say he was happy for all those things that he had to suffer with. And the choices that were made in his family as well as by others made his life very, very difficult up to that point. And some of you know what that means. Some of you have been through some very difficult times and you know the effects of those decisions. You know the pain and the difficulty of being on the short end of the stick over and over again. And I, I think it's probably safe to assume none of us have been thrown into a cistern, as if there's anybody, any cistern thrown in, probably not. Brothers haven't tried to kill you, at least that you know of. You haven't been made a slave. But that doesn't mean that some of the things that you've had to deal with have been extremely, extremely painful and still impact your life today. The question then really for us to ask is how did Joseph deal with those things? Because he was just like you and me, a regular guy. What can we learn from his life that will help us when we are dealing with the effects of the choices made in our families? What are the choices that Joseph made where we can read his story today and see the difference? And that's what I want to kind of wrap up with today is three choices that we see in our text that Joseph made. The first one, he chose to believe that God was with him no matter what things looked like. He lived as if God was with him in spite of where fate took him. I want to read that again. He lived as if God was with him in spite of where fate took him. I want to, in chapter 39, four different places just in that one chapter, he talks about God being with him. The Lord, let me read uh, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Verse 20. But while Joseph was there in prison, 
the Lord was with him. Verse 23, the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So think about this. That very moment that Joseph was sold into slavery, the Lord was with him. When Joseph was working so hard and making his master rich and not receiving anything, guess what? The Lord was with him. When Joseph was falsely accused by Mrs. Potiphar, the Lord was with him. When Joseph was unjustly imprisoned, the Lord was with him. And I want you to think about what you've had to deal with in those circumstances and those decisions. And I want you to say in your own mind that the Lord was with you. I don't think it means it was easy. I, don't, I mean, it was very difficult. I don't think he woke up every morning and said, boy, am I glad to be a slave today. What a great day. I don't think, did he struggle with why his brothers would do such an awful thing to him? I'm pretty sure. Did he not wonder at times, God, why? Why, God? Why are you allowing this? What it did mean, though, is that when he was struggling with any of the unjust things that happened to him, he knew that he was not alone no matter what it felt like. It's amazing we sang that song. He knew that God was with him, and he made a choice to believe that God was with him, no matter what it felt like. I don't know your story. I don't know the effects of the choices made in your family, but I know this. I know that the Lord is with you then, and I believe that he is with you now. And one of the things that our trials and our difficulties and our challenges do for us, it causes us to turn our faces to him and say, God, I have nothing. I need you. I need your help. I don't know about you, but when things are going pretty smoothly for me, I'm not thinking sometimes about my need for the Lord. And when we look at those trials, it really causes us to focus on him. And I know that God does not want you to deal with those things alone and by yourself. His desire is that we would come to him and find that his presence is comforting. I looked up, I love these verses. There's three verses here. I just want you to listen to the comfort of his promise. And I want you to think about this in the middle of whatever it is that you've dealt with or you're dealing with now. First one's very familiar. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are, what is it? Can you say it with me? With me. For you are with me. Isaiah 41, 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do you believe that this morning? I want you to choose to by faith that God is with you. Secondly, Joseph made a choice to honor God to the best of his ability in the situation that he was in. Despite being in prison, if you notice throughout the whole text here, Joseph worked hard. He honored God with his heart and his actions. You never read anything about bitterness or anger. But he continues to work with integrity. And those who watch Joseph work, they noticed. They could see the difference. They saw what he was doing. And there's no way he could have accomplished this if he did not keep putting forth his best efforts. Genesis 39, 23, the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. I think he was able to do this because he remembered the first choice that God was with him. And if he's with me, then I am going to be obedient to him. I think we find the same thing true when you think of Mrs. Potiphar's advances toward him. No one would have had any idea if he gave in to her pressure. He could have said, you know what, life has been tough, and I deserve this. So I'm just going to, I'm going to give in. It's not, it's not worth it, so I'm just going to give in. I love his response. Genesis 39, verse 8, but with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has held nothing from me except you because you are his wife, why don't you read this last line with me? How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? 
How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? I wonder, I thought about this this week. I wonder if all of us would stop before we do anything. That idea pops into our mind. That thought pops in. What if we said that sentence? How much we'd save ourselves, shame and guilt, all those kind of things. Joseph could have just remained angry and bitter about his circumstances, but he didn't. And to be honest with you, that's a choice that every one of us will have to make too. How will I respond or deal with the consequences of my family's choices and decisions in my life? Will I honor God or will I choose not to? And honoring, what does that mean? I will submit to his ways. And what that means, I'll walk in obedience to the things that God reveals to us in his word. Even if I don't understand what that's going to come out like, what it's going to be. Joseph made one more choice. He chose to believe that God had a plan in spite of all he was going through. He chose to believe that there was a plan. Um, and it was a plan that God would use to honor Joseph, uh, but also to protect the nation of Israel from destruction. It wasn't something that Joseph understood as he got thrown into the cistern, when he got sold into slavery. It wasn't a place where, all, oh, okay, God, I see what you're doing. It was something that God showed him. We see this at the very end of the story in Joseph's life. And if you remember, Joseph was put in charge of the distribution of the grain, and everybody had to come to Egypt to be able to get their food. And one of the families that came, of course, was, it was his family. And his brothers come up, and they don't recognize Joseph and he finally reveals himself. He asks about his father. And ultimately, with lots of details in between the story, uh, Jacob shows up and he's welcomed to Egypt. And Joseph arranges a meeting with the Pharaoh and they give him this land in Goshen. And during that time, the Israelites really lived in comfort until uh, he died uh, about 17 years later. Joseph brought 70 people or Jacob brought 70 people, and that was, they would have been destroyed, and the nation of Israel would have been done. Now, dad dies, his brothers are going, uh-oh, we're in trouble, so they start conniving up another little story, and they wanted to make sure that Joseph didn't go against them, and they were afraid he would take revenge. But listen to Joseph's words. Genesis 50, verse 19. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm you and to harm me but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives you intended to harm me but God intended it for good I was reading a little bit and I found Max Licato was a, he's an author a pastor and I, I want to read what he wrote on this verse Joseph told his brothers using a Hebrew verb that traces its meaning to weave or plate you wove evil, he was saying, but God rewove re it for good. God, the master weaver. He stretches the yarn and intertwines the colors, the ragged twine with the velvet strings, the pains and the pleasures. Nothing escapes his reach. Every king, every despot, weather patterns and molecules are at his command. And he passes the shuttle back and forth across the generations. And as he does, a design emerges. Satan weaves, God reweaves. I want you to know this this morning. God wants to reweave all the stuff from your past that the evil one's hand was involved with. It caused pain. And he wants to create something that's beautiful. What happened to you has happened. What you do with what happened to you is up to you. And God wants to be a part of the process. You don't have to figure it out on your own. All God asks us to do is to bring him our hurts, our trials, our past, and allow him to do what he can do best, the one who made you and created you, who has a plan for you. This morning, maybe you're thinking, boy, what do I do? I've got all this stuff. This morning, you could take a simple step of coming up front. We're going to have some people up here that you could pray with. You don't have to give them the details of your, of your past, but you can say, hey, I, I just need somebody to pray for me because I'm hurting. If you'd like to set up an appointment to talk to me, they pay me to do that stuff, and I love it, to be honest with you. So give me a call. I would love to be able to just sit down and chat with you. 
I was thinking another thing is being a part of a small group is really a wonderful way to be involved with a, a group of people, much smaller, much more intimate, that they, you can share your story and they can support you and pray for you and be with you. So I'd encourage you to think through some of those things. I want to invite the van to come up. Um, maybe this morning, maybe this morning you're thinking about the past decisions and choices that you've made and the impact that they've had on your family, maybe your kids or your wife. Maybe there's been terrible destruction because of that. I think admitting that this morning is really the first step. Anything that we want to move forward on, we have to admit that we've done something. And that when we do that, it really begins the potential process of reconciliation. It's not guaranteed, but for you to take ownership of it is a very powerful thing. Seeking counsel from others to take next steps. And know this, that God understands our brokenness and our pain. Isn't that why he sent Jesus? He sent him because we're broken and we need his forgiveness. And this morning, if we'll just surrender our lives to him, uh, he will be with us and through all the things we've gone through. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, there's none of us here in a perfect family, that's for sure. As we reminded last week, there's hardly any perfect families in the Bible, that's for sure. But you love us, and you take the brokenness, and you take the pain, and you can create something that's beautiful. I don't know how you'll do that, what that will look like, but we can trust you to do that. I pray, Lord, this morning, if someone is really just thinking about all those things, they would just take a step of faith and do something a little different than they've done before to find recovery and to find the hope that you can reweave some of those things. We love you so very much, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. I'll be outside on the left of the church if anybody wants to just say hi to me, but um, thank you.